Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of our magnum opus. Today's podcast features a new and returning opus TA, someone that I haven't necessarily been able to get to know terribly well, only because I've only had the opportunity to work with him for about two years. So please help me welcome Pat Gallagher, Patrick Gallagher, lead TA from last year's opus. Thanks again for joining us, Pat. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Drew? extraordinary really really good to talk to you because as lead ta and someone that has had roots and opus in a little bit longer than maybe a couple other people i'm really excited to be able to ask you a couple of questions that just i don't know get to pick your brain about opus and the positives the pros and the cons and then of course everything that you have been doing recently so let's go ahead and get started patrick can you tell us a little bit about your background as a musician so maybe when you started playing what instruments you're playing, how many instruments you play, if you play multiple, all that fun stuff. Sure, yeah. So um, I started playing the violin when I was five. Um, I started with the Suzuki, uh, five, six, probably probably first grade. So however old you are in first grade. Um, And I was doing the Suzuki method. And I stuck with that probably up until mm, about uh, 12 or so. And then I took a year off, which is kind of unusual. Um, I didn't take any lessons. I still played. But then when I came back, I switched to the viola and I've been playing viola ever since. So, you know, I'm a little bit older than than 12 now. So it's been a while. (laughs) I did not know that about you, that you took a year off and and that you started playing when you were five or six. I think that's awesome. Can I ask what tempted you to take that year off? Uh, So it was... um, it was right like towards the end of junior high and I just wasn't practicing. And at the time I had switched away from a traditional, um, well not traditional, but a Suzuki teacher to one who teaches more with just a normal uh, method of instruction. And um, he sort of fired me, but not really. <laughs> it was it was more like, hey, look, if you want to keep going, you're going to have to practice more. And I was like, well, I don't want to practice more, so I guess I'm not going to keep going. Yeah, gotcha. Sometimes taking a step back like that, it's exactly what you need to kind of not get burned out and just kind of rekindle yourself and the love for it. How did you get involved in Opus? And how long have you been involved in Opus? Um, So I think I got involved in Opus in 2015, maybe? Yeah, it was, uh, or 2014. One of those years, um, I was... Um, in college studying music ed and I didn't have, I was simultaneously thinking about pursuing performance. And so I had auditioned at a bunch of, um, different performing camps and I ended up going the route of working, um, kind of as like a TA, but also as a camp counselor for a Suzuki, um, Institute in Wisconsin. And then that was earlier on in the summer. And then it kind of left my second half of the summer free. And then I uh, worked for Opus that summer as a TA. Whoa. Did you say you were um, a camp counselor for a Suzuki camp in the summer? Uh, Yes, I did. Uh, In Stevens Point, Wisconsin, I was their like head male counselor for one year. Are you a Suzuki certified teacher? No, but uh, I may pursue that in the future. Right now I'm pursuing um, a master's degree in curriculum and instruction, but uh, I'm not ruling out the idea of Suzuki training. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, let's talk about that just a little bit because I've had one other Suzuki teacher, Miss Amanda Fenton, who was my, <clears throat> actually she was our first faculty interview. She was very, very pleasant to be able to do that. But she gave us a little bit of insight as to what Suzuki teaching and training was. So as someone who has kind of come off the backbone of um, being taught the Suzuki method for what sounds like at least a decade, what do you think are maybe some pros and cons? And actually, you can even give us an overview what the heck the Suzuki method is for those of us that don't know. Yeah, sure. So let's start there with what it is. Um, Suzuki method is a... um, it's a method of violin, viola, cello, bass. I think there's also voice and flute and piano instruction as well um, that teaches you to play songs 
by what they'll call like a mother tongue or a rote method. So instead of sitting there and diligently learning how to read all the notes uh, before you really start getting into playing the notes, um, a really good example of that would be like Essential Elements is a book that kind of goes that a more traditional route is a way that people mm -hmm. de delineate between the two of these. Um, mm -hmm. Suzuki will launch you right in there with playing um, easy and familiar uh, tunes, and then they'll teach you music theory through the acquisition of those different pieces in the sequence of the books. Gotcha. So you are really kind of learning to play music as though you're learning a language. Like when you're a young, young, young kid, you learn English or whatever your native tongue is by your parents speaking it. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea behind Suzuki is that you don't learn to read the music necessarily right off the bat, but you learn what music's supposed to sound like, kind of like when parents are just talking to their children. So then you're able to just picture and pick up what music's supposed to sound like, what violin is supposed to sound like through rote or the process of someone playing it for you. That is exactly right. Um, it's, it's very much uh, similar to learning a language when you're a child. Gotcha. Okay. Man, that is that sounds very, very intensive, but also an incredibly good idea. Uh, obviously, there's probably pros and cons to both of them, but that's beyond my pay grade. So um, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned that you were studying music education when you started uh, working with Opus, and you are currently pursuing a master's in curriculum development. Was that right? Curriculum and instruction, yes. Curriculum and instruction. Gotcha. What kind of puts you on the path toward music education? And definitely, I want to hear a little bit about the curriculum instruction uh, masters you're getting. Of course, yeah. Um, so in high school, um, at that same camp that I ended up working as a counselor at, I attended. And one summer, I remember we played um, Shostakovich String Quartet Number no. 8. And it was something that I organized with a couple of my other friends who had gone to the camp previously we were I think we were on Facebook, like really early version of Facebook, um, messaging back <laughs> and forth and saying like, Hey, we should come up with something fun because usually the pieces we play are kind of boring to us. Um, we happen to be some more advanced people that attended the camp. And so we did this whole thing and I really liked the idea of being able to like put groups together. And then at the same time, um, when I, even before that I had, helped uh, volunteered um, I took karate for a number of years and so I would um, once I got my black belt I would volunteer uh, with you know helping with the younger classes and stuff I think probably this was like when I was 13 or 14 and so I kind of always had that idea that maybe I want to teach and then after that summer of playing Shostakovich 8 for whatever reason it solidified my desire to want to be a teacher and it took me a little while to figure out I wanted to be a music teacher but um, yeah nice okay and so you're currently, the, what put you on the path of getting a master's? Uh, so I got my first master's um, directly Whoa. out of undergrad <laughs> um, in, in music performance. Um, so kind of as, a, as another diversion, I finished with my undergrad degree in education. And I said, you know, I am decently good at playing. I would like to see where this could go. Um, and to see, you know, I, I talked to a bunch of people and they said, well, if you're going to try to do it, best to try and do it at the youngest age possible because um, it becomes much more harder later to try and like make it into a professional orchestra or go back to school and get a master's or a doctorate mm -hmm. in performance. Um, mm -hmm. So I went and I did that for two years. I auditioned for a bunch of ensembles, um, both kind of like regional orchestras and then some professional orchestras. And then kind of realized that while I liked playing music a lot, I didn't necessarily like all of the intense and somewhat robotic preparation that goes into being able to play for a professional orchestra. Um, so I took a job as a substitute teacher for a long-term substitute teacher at a school in Minnesota. And I loved it like way more than I ever did during undergrad. And so I've, so I'm doing now I'm teaching uh, orchestra, the fourth through eighth graders. That kind of answered my next question. You have a master's in performance and an undergrad in teaching. So I was going to ask what you preferred and which which world maybe you had more of your of your fingers in. But that sounds like even though music is definitely still something you love and you'll still perform whenever possible, teaching is just that extra calling to you. Is that kind of about right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, teaching has a reward that's way different, and in my 
uh, opinion a little bit better than making a really good performance. Wow. That's actually really nice to hear. Um, I don't, I haven't been able to interview too many educators that I've been able to take that stance of education first with Patrick. That's, I think that's awesome. And you're incredibly accurate. I teach a couple of students on the side and you're right. A great lesson is just, it feels great. A lot of progress is made on both ends. Well, as somebody with a master's in performance, I think you might like this next question. We always like to end each of our segments by asking everybody one favorite practice tip. And everyone says, whoa, I don't know where to start. So I could ask you if you have maybe 45 minutes to practice. You can go whatever direction you want with this question, but this is this might just help. If you have 45 minutes to practice, how do you make it diligent? How do you make it a good practice session? If I have 45 minutes to practice, I'm probably going to spend... Well, at my point now, I probably would spend a few minutes warming up, but I would mostly dive into what I have to learn, and I play it slowly um, with mm-hmm. the metronome and work it up from there. If if it had been, you know, if I was a student of mine that I was giving this advice to, I would say to practice scales for like 25 minutes. Um, really diligently practice scales with the metronome. Gotcha. What's the benefit of playing scales? Uh, so like... Uh, to me, scales are like uh, just the foundation for everything you do. Like when you learn to walk as a kid, you don't start off running. You start off crawling and you kind of build your ability to balance. And then you you know come up onto two feet and finally you're able to run. Um, and so same with scales. Like if you practice them kind of in all different ways, you really learn where your fingers are supposed to go and what it's importantly supposed to feel like when you're playing in tune. And then uh, mm-hmm. learning a piece of music, it becomes exponentially easier. Gotcha. Okay. So I think that another great practice tip from Patrick here is just know your scales. Obviously you can um, spend 25 minutes of your 45 minutes practicing them, but knowing scales is a hugely important factor of any piece you play. And it probably just helps memorizing key signatures a little bit faster too. Well, Patrick, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day. Busy, busy as a man with two masters in performance and teaching will be. But I want to thank you again. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. And as everyone listening out there, stay tuned next week for another episode of our Magnum Opus podcast. Thanks, guys.